great. It was great. Thanks for all the, the chatting and the guitar playing. It was all kinds of fun. So now we get down to some artwork and some poetry. Uh, uh, Richard Sober has uh, is one of the people I've been lucky enough to get to know through the bookstore. I was we had only been open a couple of weeks and. Richard came walking in and said, I've got this book. Uh, would you be interested in carrying it? I was like, oh, man. But Richard showed me this book, and it is truly beautiful. I was stunned. I said immediately, yes, please. And uh, I took three or four for the store and immediately took one home. Um, it's Richard is... Uh, the artist who's painted the work that's hanging around the the store tonight. Um, some of it is from the book. It is uh, it is all for sale. Uh, just contact Richard about it. You know, we just deal with it through him. Uh, Richard uh, has a long history of publishing and doing artwork and very just. Um, I'm really pleased to be able to have him in the store and to read for it. Thank you, Richard. Thanks, Joe. Happy anniversary. Everybody all right? That sounds good. All right. I uh, like to uh, give out drawings. Before I read, and tonight is no exception. So if you could start passing those around, if you'd like one, keep it. Uh, if you like two, keep that. There you go, my dear. <laughs> hey, baby, I see you selling and watermelons I see you selling the melons and the moon One day maybe you'll be singing to me baby I see you selling the melons and the moon I uh <coughs> brought two paintings here that uh, are part of the book uh, that I wrote and painted. And uh, for a long time I was never sure uh, what to do with my painting and my poetry in, in regards uh, to putting them together because they're always sort of separate and equal to me and I never, even though I had uh, long uh, loved William Blake and Kenneth Patch and other people, even Henry Miller, that combined their writing and their and their visual art. Uh, I was never quite uh, sure how I wanted to do that, and uh, gradually, over years, actually starting in the late 1990s and early 2000s, I started um, developing. It's a long story, but not worth telling. But. Uh, this is what I do, partly what I do. It, this, I've made, the, the book originally had about 120 uh, images and um, at the time that represented about 10% of my painting uh, that I do. So in a way, the book is a very small part of uh, my life as far as uh, quantity goes. But um, maybe I'll read off of this one. Start reading. I'll do that. Let me read my painting. It's funny how sometimes a clear, cold Thursday morning can seem like a Sunday. Can you guys hear me back there, Joe? You hear me? Yeah. You're yeah. good. Okay. When the streets are almost deserted and nothing is open yet, when every other business is shut down or boarded up or for sale, how you can't tell if a town is on its way up or on its way down or on its way to anywhere at all. You're somewhere you've never been before and everyone who works is about to go to work, but you're not working. You're walking around first thing in the morning looking for life. 
this town was not so much left behind or neglected, but that once or twice in its history it boomed and the bursting of dreams and myths it busted, or it closed for years and just lingers on and on, and the people in it endure. You drop in from nowhere. The marquee of the movie house says a new film is showing, but the cinema looks as if it's been closed for years and won't open for a few more. The main street dead ends at a garage washed up against the prairie. Colder air will come in with the night. A mariachi band will play to the drunken dancers on top of the bar of the hotel saloon. You can hear it outside in the sweet air as if ghosts were having a party. And I'm just going to pass this around. You can have a look at it so you can see what it looks like if you want. And just pass it back up, please. Okay, so I'm going to read a few pieces from the book, and then I'm going to read uh, a few pieces from two manuscripts, one called um, Borrowed Earth and one called Fictive Kin that I'm working on simultaneously. Uh, when I reached the sanctuary for the maladjusted, no one was here to greet me with a smile, a hearty handshake, or outstretched arms. The air is clean. The beauty is intoxicating. I knew this place was inhabited by second-class angels. People betrayed each other as anywhere. In the morning, someone still owed someone money. Sometimes I wake up and think I'm in New Mexico driving past hills and arroyos where people burn themselves out searching for what is not lost, what can never be found. Sometimes I'm walking up and down streets of towns that never saw better days, though storytellers would like you to believe otherwise. Sometimes I sit across from a man in a courtyard who tells me he has planned his life so he doesn't have to live it. His eyes ask me to complete his sentences. One of my co-workers sometimes tries to save me. I say I don't want to be saved. A voice on an answering machine says, hello, he's alive and he loves you. Leave a message. I only believe in these moments, I say. Then I look up from the steering wheel of the car and realize I'm driving across the Galenus River towards the plaza in Las Vegas the late afternoon sun illuminating the Plaza Drugs sign at the corner pharmacy, the gazebo looking shipwrecked in the green light. It's happy hour. Cars are parked everywhere. No one is around. <clears throat> Behind me, an elderly woman smooth talks Chopin on her shiny piano. Her faux golden hair, her absent-minded smile, the nocturnes glowed in the half-lit room. The woman's translucent hands seemed disembodied from the enthralled look on her face. I was facing west behind a window of the Taos Country Club. A solitary golfer in a blue windbreaker puttered on the green. I watched rain trying to fall near the Hamas. The sky was purple, green, turquoise, orange, blue. A huge violet cloud moved just above the horizon like an alien spaceship. What a sad place. All this money, all this bad art, no one listening to the crazed woman, the golfer oblivious to the wild sunset. The Rio Grande Gorge a few miles away, some people thinking they had escaped a world they couldn't live in. We manufacture our loneliness if we feel we've left it too far behind. James turned to me and said, this isn't really Taos. I said, sure it is, just another part of it. As I pulled out of town, my words were swallowed by the road ahead of me. I'm going to depart from this for a second. Uh, here. This was uh, written in 2003. I don't know why I'm doing this, but it doesn't matter. Um, the 
is what it looks like. It's a pretty simple image. It's uh, supposed to be along the Delaware River, but it's just a painting of, of my thought about that. Okay. It's not the Delaware River. You can't go swimming in it or anything. Okay. I remember sitting with my brother in the back seat of my father's Plymouth, or was it the Galaxy 500 as we drove home from Atlantic City on Route 40? My father was somehow lost trying to cross the Susquehanna River. My parents argued about my father being lost as the late afternoon shadows of trees flickered across the road in and out of the car. We were riding through a speeded up silent film. It didn't matter to me if we were lost or not. It happened before and it would happen again either in the Big Blue Bonneville or the American Rambler. Getting to the Harbor Tunnel or back to Atlantic City, winding up on Tacony Palmyra Bridge when we were trying to get to the Ben Franklin Bridge. I just enjoyed being in motion, fascinated, being magically transported by this kind-hearted, somewhat flustered charioteer who always seemed more present when he wasn't around and more absent when he was. Is everybody still doing okay tonight? What's going on? Okay. Are you taking the house down? What's that? I'm the house it's not down. time to take the show down yet. No. <laughs> um, I think I'll read this. America is built like a brick shit house. <laughs> Someone locked the user inside and took the key to another country. I was lost in this thought when I was taking my usual Saturday morning walk along Camino San Acasio, past Cerrito, past Victoria, past Camino Sin Nombre. Another glorious morning in the land of little rain. Hummingbirds, beaks glistened with nectar, lilacs sweetening the green morning. The view from Camino San Acasio in springtime is breathtaking even as grief, loss, trauma, and fear litter other landscapes. The blue Hamas lie on the other side of the Rio Grande. Barbarians are at the door lobbing stones over the wall. I hear about them on the radio, in the newspapers, rattling padlock chains at the gates. The view from this caged throne is exquisite. The world can appear wild if you don't look too hard. There is another, there's, excuse me, there is nothing mystical about it. One that you don't need only stroll through one's own mind to feel the almost palpable sense of falling, of being suffocated, of being watched. You are propelled through space. The landmarks of one's youth disappearing, the ones that remain meaningless to anyone else. Soon you will walk down the streets or crowded cities and no one will be smiling. Floodwaters rise above fax machines in Bangladesh. Plutonium canyons bloom Cold War flowers and fill Yemeni towers. When scavengers fill the night streets of Buenos Aires, owls spread their talons in the upland deserts of the southwest. A saxophone floats off the coast of Louisiana. All along the watchtower, princes wear shirts made by someone whose body burns on a goth in Benares at dawn. I would have climbed the corporate ladder, but all the rungs were missing, and I used the side rails for the fence around my house to keep my thoughts to myself. The wood is rotting, so some of what I want to say seems to have a life of its own. I hear the barbarians are us, sitting here, locked in with a splendid view, questionable memories. Lilacs sweetening the green morning. Every evening at nine o'clock, I drive out of a box of lights that glows in the desert, stretching like a sick arm to the southwest. The silhouette of the Hamas under a frozen moonlit sky, I drive east of the mountains, looking at the illuminated Chemiza scented badlands from the corners of my eyes as my body glides into the wide sweep 
of the off-ramp speeding onto the interstate, an asphalt snake dreaming oceans of another country. It is common advice to think outside the box. It is another thing to live outside the box, to find yourself an outsider when your contemporaries are just settling in for the golden years, the days of wine and roses, strolls through the well-earned green meadows of middle and old age, not worried about finding any particular truth, choosing, for instance, not to fight the good fight, as that is, the only, as that is only something found in a book or movie outside a box. I move between a box of light and a box of dark sky, a river descending between two part-time jobs held down in a nightmare wrestling match a river of invention and reinvention flowing down to an imaginary sea, alive for a moment between two darknesses. Some of my best friends are strangers. They are principled, heroic, and doomed. Together, we gaze upon a Sumerian horizon from where we sit an ocean of collective fear persuades us to offer up appeasing gifts of food, money, toil, and soul to the jealous gods and long-armed spirits. Otherwise, the world will collapse, be withheld, or implode until further notice. It is as if most of us were created specifically to liberate others from the necessity of working for a living and ourselves condemned to always be looking for a job. The law requires you to bend over and submit your thanks under penalty of pain, banishment, and death. The gods of money are insatiable and merciless, but they are private persons with names and addresses. We gaze upon the horizon. The world is in no danger of being overwhelmed by a flood of love. It need not fear being consumed by a fire of generosity. The people I love linger on street corners. But now it's our turn to pay tribute to the homegrown barbarians disguised as genuine men who only look like us. In our sleep, we dream of falling, of being stabbed by strangers. We disappear like a person in a one night stand around an early morning corner. Okay, I'm just going to read a couple of pieces from uh, one manuscripts that I'm working on. Still doing okay? Yeah. yeah okay. That's I want to know how you escaped into a Buddhist temple and flew to Havana to see, keep in mind this is a manuscript, okay, just whatever. I want to know how you escaped into a Buddhist temple and flew to Havana to see Fidel play baseball and walk through the alleys of Baltimore in every season and cried next to the waters of the Delaware and wandered the Parisian night with its dampness following you through every park and how you vanished into the secret rainforest that still held antidotes to pain and tried through sincerity to warm the shoulders of those too shy to ever look comfortable in a photograph while you stood here in this room where you said you'd be back in a minute. Uh, this is a quote from a uh, therapist I was seeing a few years ago. And uh, I, he, he told me this, and I didn't pay attention to anything else that happened that day except that I ran in my car and wrote it down because it, was just, it, was, it struck me. These times are difficult. Once upon a time, I lived on $5,000 a year. I hunted and fished. There is something about being close to nature. My grandfather told me this. Once animals stood on two legs, but now they are disappointed in humans. Dogs were the last animals to walk on four legs. They still listen to humans in the hope they will stop sleepwalking. Now I shop at Albertsons. Okay, uh, 
I'm going to read two more poems and I'll call it a night. Um, somewhere along the line, I must have been in New York in the autumn. Once I knew 4,000 languages. Now I barely speak one. The vagrant on the corner with the sign is a monk down on his luck. We are living words of an elaborate refusal. There is no we here, only a moving collection of rumors. A coalition of ghost voices echoing in our chests, the hallway tiled with the intimidated voices of the almost vanquished. What woods remained in our neighborhood we used to play in? Cowboys and Indians exchanging fire between popsicles and ice cream cones. You could hide for hours waiting for the enemy to attack, but they never came. The leaves stood still, the hot buzz of the air hovered over every stone, everyone disappeared. When you try to piece together your life, sometimes all that remains is a 15-year-old boy on a boulder, drunk with fear he couldn't speak. Somewhere along the line, I must have been in New York in the autumn, walking on 2nd Avenue with the huddled masses, learning what a picturesque trap life could be. I only wanted a cup of coffee in a steamy coffee shop to shake the soreness off my shoes to go to sleep in the tenement bedroom with the woman who stilled my heart. I must have kicked some leaves on Fifth Avenue, eaten lentil soup at the Odessa, slept in Grace Hardigan's rent-controlled apartment, snorted cocaine in the bathroom of St. Mark's Church. Somewhere along the line, I must have left New York through a tunnel, never returning to the same world again. And I'll read one more poem. You guys are an awfully quiet audience. <laughs> Amazing. I'm making all the noise. Not used to that. It's like, heckle me, asshole, asshole. Okay. Talking suitcase. This is called Talking Suitcase. Um, what was it called? Talking Suitcase. <laughs> talking Suitcase. Your silence can't be pride from this restless distance. Your spaceship is bigger and faster than mine. The velocity of ambition travels at the speed of fear in the rearview mirror, too early or too late for an alternate route. I scan you, I scanned you onto a painting where you are leaning against a car in the badlands north of the Plaza of Despair. You are in some kind of trance, unwinding a scarf containing the history of your needs. Some people remember where they are going, some never forget where they've been. Flying into this world like a word, spread like a seed. You are a late bloomer. You've got it made standing there in your desert finery, destined for a spot in the museum of irony and metaphor. You call yourself a talking suitcase, but you always travel light and visible, whispering on the breeze. You clamp your hand over my mouth without lifting a finger. You close doors without missing a step. That's it, folks. Thank you.